what drives a scientist to explore inner dimensions of human life. 21st century has witnessed series of discussions between modern science and spirituality. There are different versions included in these series of discussions. Modern science has made human lives much easier and compatible, but will it be able to act as an, as an antidote of human sufferings? In the meantime, I have spoken with Dr. Sandra Magnus, a former US-based NASA astronaut and Buddhist meditation practitioner to speak about different issues of human life. I have spoken with her about science, spirituality, and way of life. In the meantime, I would like to quote a passage from my uh, teacher, Yungi Bingi Rupache, from his book, Joy of Living. By the way, Yungi Bingi Rupache is uh, the one uh, Tibetan master who is trying to culminate between trying to amalgamate modern science and Buddhism in the wider spectrum. So, his definition of emptiness, which you say a little bit about this. Uh, I would like to quote how he defines emptiness. Because of because the nature of our mind is emptiness, you possess the capacity to experience a potentially unlimited variety of thoughts, emotions, and sensations. Even misunderstandings of emptiness are simply phenomena arising out of emptiness. The last line, even misunderstandings of emptiness are simply phenomena arising out of emptiness. Yeah, I think um, we all have perceptions in our minds that are based on our experiences. I know my perceptions have changed over the years based on my experiences and, and how knowledge has changed from intellectual based to experience based. Um, I know that if I, if I tell you that I visited a modern art museum and on the wall was a canvas, a big red square, and that was considered a piece of art. You all, every person in this room will have a different idea in their head of what a big red square is like. Some of you have small squares, some of you have big squares, some of you have dark red, some of you have bright red. And so that's your version of a red square. Is any one of those correct or incorrect? Or none of those correct, right? So the emptiness part is maybe none of them are correct, and, and because we're all perceiving them differently, it's not really an actual thing. I mean, as a scientist, I don't know if I can really describe it with any kind of scientific theory. I, I think it goes back to we're all sort of our own little universes of that we have our own perceptions and our own ideas about what different words and concepts mean, and so what's right and what's wrong. So when you communicate with people you're working internationally, one of the things that I always watch for is um, <coughs> the context of the conversation and how they're using words and what's their cultural context because even in English we run into communication problems so when we work across cultures you have to be very aware of that as well. So I'm pretty sure I didn't answer your question but that's the only thing I've got for you. <laughs> <laughs> but because and the idea of emptiness from a scientific viewpoint is is really hard to describe based on my understanding of science, and I'm not by, by any means you know, one of the top scientists in the world, so they, someone a lot smarter than me might have a better answer on that. For, uh, for the inquisitive brains, we will have uh, question and answer sessions after our conversation, so you, uh, your any kind of feedback queries are Highly accepted. I would like to. I would like to comment. You know, out in space, it's a it's a vacuum, right? There's no air. There's nothing out there. And the idea of a place from a science viewpoint, you know, idea of a vacuum, the fact that there's nothing in there is. I mean, it's, we understand it, but yet at the same time, it seems kind of weird, right? Because sound can't travel through a vacuum. 
and electromagnetic wave scan. So there's, I mean, that's one of those things I think we understand intellectually, but we don't understand internally, exper experientially. Just like gravity, we understand gravity intellectually. I'm the only person in this room that understands gravity experientially. <laughs> and so there's a lot of things that we do as scientists where we understand it intellectually, but we haven't necessarily had the experience at the same level to change that type of knowledge. And I think that makes a big difference. And you have seen before that uh, you're taught so many things in your life before you went to your exposition. Uh, and you knew, you knew lots of things. But did you, did you have a feeling of knowing yourself, who you are, before you went to space exploration? And uh, my, my next question is, does the knowledge uh, does the knowledge we acquire from outside the world, from, from the teachers, from, from the books, make sense uh, if you compare your experience and best knowledge? So, how do you see your, your own experience as a wisdom or as a transcendental knowledge? Um, well, certainly, we are all growing every day as human beings, and I, I think I was having a conversation with my niece, for example. She's 13. It's difficult being a 13-year-old girl. I don't care where you are in the world. And she was telling me, you know, she was trying to uh, figure out who she was. And I told her, I said, Margie, I didn't have any kind of clue who I was as a human being until I was 31. Right? Because there are so many things that we learn as we grow, and hopefully I'm going to continue to do that. But one of the the, um, the things that was interesting about my career as an astronaut is I had such a wide variety of unusual experiences and unusual things that people were training me on that I really had an opportunity to grow in a very rapid and broad way because of the, the breadth of the experiences I've had. And I learned a lot about myself during that the course of that training and of course uh, getting on orbit and having some of that intellectual knowledge changed to experiential knowledge changed my perceptions about a lot of things as well. So I would say that I had a decent idea about who I was when I joined the Corps, but I grew a lot more during the Astronaut Corps. And even leaving the Astronaut Corps, I took a job uh, running an organization. I had never done that before. And while I used a lot of the lessons that I had learned in my astronaut career there, I also learned some more things about myself as well. So hopefully we're, as human beings, we're in this constant stage of learning and growing. But I feel like by the time I was in my 40s, I had a pretty good, solid idea of my, my, uh, my basics. And one of the things that, uh, as I got older, that I really, and again, goes back to reading some Buddhist philosophy, was really understanding about uh, releasing negative emotions and not letting them control you, not letting other people drive your behavior. Because, you know, as a female in a male-dominated field, sometimes you run into men who don't quite understand that it's okay to be a female in a male-dominated world. <laughs> and um, they act in inappropriate ways, and you can't respond to that. You have to let those kinds of things go. Because they're basically putting on a lot of negative energy, and if you get caught up in it, you're letting them trap you in their pool. And so learning things like that, um, you learn those by experience. And it's hard to let some of that stuff go. But once you do, it's, it's the best advice I give to young women. You, you can't let other people define who you are. You cannot do that. You have to decide who you want to be. And even in the pressures of being an astronaut, you know, there are, there are events that come up and, and people are trying to force you into a box because they have expectations. And it's really important to figure out who you want to be and strive to be that person. And I think those are lessons that I've learned along the way. And I'm, hopefully I'll still continue to learn. I would hate to think um, that I would be static. You don't want to be static as a human being. You want to grow and you want to develop. We have got two uh, lamas who hail from Tibetan Buddhism. So maybe they will have some feedback or comment on, on this. I'd like to quote again from uh, uh, Carl Sagan, Sagan again, Carl Sagan, Sagan uh, uh, cosmologist. cosmologist. 
and it has uh, this uh, court is, I mean, court has nothing to do with our conversation Sunday. So we'll switch to the next question. In its encounter with nature, science invariably elucidates a sense of reverence in awe. The very act of understanding is a celebration of joining, uh, merging, even uh, if, if, if even if on a very modest scale with the magnificence of cosmos. Oh, I'm, I think I'm repeating this. Uh, okay, so I, I think the, I'm repeating this. Uh, so I would like to I would like to quote uh, Albert Einstein here. So like, would you mind? Okay. The religion. The religion. The religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend the personal God and avoid dogma and theology. Covering both the natural and the spiritual, it should be based on a religious sense arising from the experience of all things natural and spiritual as a meaningful unity. Buddhism answers this description. If there is any religion that could cope with modern scientific needs, it would be Buddhism. So this is what Albert Einstein has said. Let me again quote Albert Einstein. He says, a human being is a part of a whole called by the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. I'd like to go back to your game, uh, to your journey in space. You have to maintain maximum level of awareness during your time span there in, 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 in meditation if I'm not wrong essence of meditation is being aware the way we are having conversation here the way we move outside and everything we do if we are doing with our awareness it becomes meaningful so how how is your feeling that you're you're being you being aware inside the space and you're trying to be aware of your feeling, sensation and emotion while practicing meditation? So how how do you synchronize or how do you try to balance that level of awareness? So can you hear me in back okay? Yeah. So basically what happens um, what Vikesh is referring to is a comment I made to him earlier. And I lived in space for four and a half months on the space station. And one, and one of the philosophies I had uh, about that experience was it's, it's necessary, uh, I believe, to be a good crew member and a successful crew member in space. It's, it's necessary to be aware, very self-aware. Because when you think about what's happening with the space mission, people have been working, scientists have been working on their experiments for five or ten years designing, theorizing, building the equipment, and finally it's in space. The equipment that we're working on in the space station was built by engineers for a decade, finally launched. So there, there are thousands of people on the ground who have an investment in the equipment and the activities and the mission, uh, the mission objectives that we're trying to do. And the whole community on the ground is there to support us and make sure that we have everything we need can, so we can do that mission for them. So they're counting on us very, very strongly to do that mission well. And so that means that our, when, I'm on, when we're on spa in space, there are, we're in a fishbowl. There are people, there are cameras on us all the time. There are people watching our every move. They're trying to second guess what we're doing. If I ask a question, like for example, I, I gave the cash the example earlier today. If I say to Houston, hey, what's the weather like there tomorrow? They'll have 17, me min uh, 17 meetings to go find out how to answer the question <laughs> because they care that much about supporting us. And so that means that if I wake up crabby one day, which sometimes we do that as human beings wake up and we don't feel so good, I, can, I had to be self-aware enough to know that I was feeling crabby, number one, and then number two, that I couldn't let it affect my behavior during the day. Because if, if I'm crabby to the ground, it's amplified about a hundred times. 
and it makes everybody's day on the ground very unpleasant. So those, you know, any so any kind of negativity is just immediately amplified, and it negatively affects the performance of the team, and it negatively affects the people who are caring so much about helping you try and get your job done. And so it was very necessary, I thought, to be a, a good crew member is to maintain a strong self-awareness, understand what's driving your emotions, and then not react, not just simply react. So that's the form of awareness that Vikesh is responding to, is having that moment-by-moment -moment thinking process about what's going on and not blindly reacting. And, and it really is required, especially, again, when you're working across cultures. Because sometimes, you know, for example, when I was working in Russia, they didn't have a, 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 a cultural norm of shaking the hands of women, right? And so as a female in a male-dominated field, it would be very easy for me to take offense at that because I could view it as a sign of disrespect. But that's not how it was intended, right? So I couldn't react emotionally in the context of my own culture. And so this self-awareness is something that um, you know, you, we could practice developing during training, but I went into my space station mission knowing this was going to be very important because negativity would, would just be hugely amplified and very destructive, and I really needed to understand when something was upsetting me, how I needed to release that, and in what appropriate fashion. By the way, we had a treadmill on orbit, so my stress relief, again, was running when I was on orbit, and so that it's really kind of an extreme mindfulness, right? Because you have to kind of be aware, kind of watch yourself from inside as you're going about your day and making sure you're not just reacting. And that, I think, is what, mm -hmm. is what Vikesh is referring to with this question. So, um, and I, you know, again, I developed that philosophy slowly as I was going through training, as I was working across so many cultures, you know, trying to, as a community, you know, make the space station work. Because it is 16 different countries, there's different languages, there's English in the metric system, there's different political systems, there's different ways of doing engineering, there's different ways of operating, but it worked because we were all committed to the goal. And we had the patience to have the same conversation 17 times until we felt like everybody understood each other, right? And, and so there was a whole community of people that were, were practicing this, and I, I learned that philosophy going through that process and translate it into, oh, this is how you have to behave on orbit as well. Okay, so I'm still skeptical and really inquisitive to know uh, how you used to make communication with your family members from this space down here. So this, that would be next font, I guess. So a lot of people think while we're on the space station that we're very disconnected from friends and family, but we're actually, in this age of advanced communications, we're actually not. I could make phone calls through a satellite to my friends and family, and by the way, it was always fun, especially, my family got used to it, of course, but I would call my friends occasionally, and they would pick up the phone, and I would say, space calling, and they got such a kick out of that, and to me, of course, it goes back to, there's an interesting one about perception, to them, this was a big deal. Right? Right. Someone, Someone was calling them from space, space. And, they and they always were, oh my gosh, this is so great. great. And to and me, me, I was, I was just, just in my normal life making, making a normal phone call. call. So to so me, it was, was no big deal, deal right? So, so completely different perceptions about, about the same, same experience, experience right, right there. there. Um, we, also we also could do could video, video conferences, conferences with our family, family on, the weekend, on the weekends, on Sundays. And so, so when, when we did we those, those, I usually made sure I was doing, doing you know, fun, fun zero-gravity zero astronaut, astronaut trips. trips. So they, so could, they get could get a little, little bit of an impression, impression about, about what my what life, life was like. But again, but again it's, it's not the same as being there. And then we had email. And so we were constantly having the opportunity to send email up and down. So the communication was actually... Ongoing, ongoing and, and, and very common. common. And it goes, and it back, goes to, back to, by the way, that building the trust and making sure you have a good relationship with Mission Control, because, because people, people would be emailing you things that maybe Mission Control had heard about or not heard about. And so, so it, would it would be really, really easy, easy to get into a communication snarl and have and some have misunderstandings some happen because, because of the way that things, things were necessarily coming up to the space station via email and things like that. that. Again, so it was very important to not react emotionally to things that you were hearing because someone could send you an email and you'd immediately think, well, why isn't Mission Control telling me that, right? And be upset about it. So again, you had to take, you had to think about all of this communication that was going on. But we're very connected while we're on the space station. There's a lot of communication going on. Zero gravity is 
very, I mean, maybe like very important for us, for me especially, a uh, uh, highly realized or let's say very serious practitioners in Tibet used to levit I mean, levitate, maintaining their zero gravity. I'm still unaware how they used to do, but I think that they, I mean, the practitioners levitating and being in the, in the, in the zero gravity and you, I mean, astronauts and being in zero gravity in the space ha has got some sort of connection. So, are you aware about any Tibetan uh, practitioners, lamas, levitating, leaving the space, and flying in the sky? Um, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. Um, my experience with gravity, and just to be clear, and when we're in space and we're going around the Earth, we're actually in free fall. So what we are is that we are going around the Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. I apologize for not using metric because I can never remember the metric. Um, and so as we're going around the Earth, we're falling to Earth, and the Earth is moving out from underneath us at the same rate. So we're in a constant free fall. So we're still in the gravitational field. But we but do we not do feel not the feel effects, effects of gravity, gravity because we're in free fall. If you've ever if been, been in an elevator, elevator and the elevator goes, goes down really fast and you kind of feel a little minute of lift, or if you've ever been on a roller coaster and you've gone over the top of the roller coaster and you feel that kind of moment where you leave your seat, that's the same thing. That's an instant of free fall. But we're in it constantly. So the fact that we're floating has to do with we're in that moment forever, you know, that little moment you feel at the top of the roller coaster. So we're still under the influence of gravity. We're just negating it by the way we're moving. And so as a scientist, well, let me, let me go back up a minute. I made a comment earlier that I understand gravity in a way that you don't. And it's true because I've been outside of the force of gravity in this free fall moment and living there. And I think you know, when you talk about the difference between intellectual knowledge and experiential knowledge, that was the biggest perception shift. Well, one of the two biggest perception shifts that I had as an astronaut was my understanding of gravity. Because I wasn't worried about re-entering Earth's atmosphere and, and coming back to gravity because I'd lived here my whole life. And it was and it fascinating, was fascinating to me. and you adapt, you adapt really quickly to zero gravity or to free fall. I'm just going to continue to use the term zero gravity. You adapt really quickly, and I'll get back to your question in just a minute. You adapt very quickly to zero gravity, and it feels very normal to, to live in, in that environment. And so as we started coming in and re-entering on my first mission, you know, we're strapped in our seat, and I was holding my procedures, my checklist of what we have to do, and all of a sudden I noticed I had to start using my arm muscles to hold, hold my, my book. book. And it and was, it was weird. weird. And all, all of a sudden, sudden I noticed, noticed that, that I, was, I had this external force pushing on my body, forcing, forcing me into the seat. And, and it was, it was horrible. horrible. And I, I, it, I, I, it, it, I still, it's hard to explain how strange it was for me that this external force from out of nowhere was all of a sudden acting on my body. And I looked at, we had a little meter on the space shuttle that told us how many Gs that we're, we're experiencing, and it was only one-third of Earth's gravity. So we were just starting to slow down and re-enter the gravitational field and lose the effect of free fall. And so when you leave the planet and you're looking down on it, what you see, and I mentioned this yesterday at the school with the children, is what you see is one organism. In science, in science terms, terms you see, see what's what called a closed, closed system. system. In a closed, closed system, system, everything, everything is, connected, is connected, and every, every action, action has a reaction, reaction and the system, the system operates as an entity. entity. The, the Earth, Earth is a closed system. system. The, the Earth, Earth is, is one organism. organism. It's, it's so, so obvious, obvious from space that, that everything, everything is connected. connected. Astronauts, Astronauts talk about, about this a lot, and the fact that you look out the window, you don't see the boundaries of countries. You don't, you don't see, see 7, seven billion, billion people. people. You, you see, see a planet. planet. You know, and no, again, going, going back, back to science terms, terms, it's a spaceship. spaceship. And we're all crew all members on, on the spaceship. spaceship. And, it's, and it's, so, so any, any action, action that we, that we do, do has a reaction, a reaction in the system. Now, it might be small or it might be large, and it's hard to measure. But anybody who thinks differently is kidding themselves because it's one system. 
And that's a perception that's extremely obvious the minute you leave the planet and that you look at it. So I'm actually, uh, just as a side note, there's, there are companies in the US who are creating spaceships uh, to launch tourists for a brief five minute exposure to space. And these are people who have, these are celebrities, these are people who have a voice in the media. And I'm very interested to find out what happens when they go up and they experience the same thing that I'm talking about because they will, and they come back and talk about it. And what does that do to the greater you know, cultures around the world? So we're at the beginning of an interesting journey as a human species as more of this kind of perception shift happens with more and more people, as more people access space. Because it's very obvious it's one system and everything is related and and so taking so you know to your question outer to inner right so looking at that it's like wow you know this is it immediately changes the context of how you think about the planet if you start thinking about it as one system and you see it's obviously all connected you know so it, it i think it'll be a really powerful um human development as more and more people get this experience because it does make you reflect on the nature of how we're, we're treating each other, treating the planet. Um, I think the space station is a good example of what we can do as human beings when we really put our minds to it and we have the will to achieve something because that, that program, again, had so many things against it with the different countries, different agendas, things like that. But it succeeded because we were committed. And so as more and more people, I think, understand that the, the planet is a system Perhaps, Perhaps the commitment and the will to work, to work together, together to solve some of the other problems will arise after that. that. But, but I think, I think the exper you know, that intellectual knowledge to experiential knowledge, that shift will be very important first. Because sometimes it's hard to act on just intellectual knowledge. Sometimes you need to experience something or feel it to learn the lesson. And that's a lesson that sticks with you much, much greater. So I'm hopeful for the future because of this trend of, of trying to get more and more people into space just so they can get that view, I think it's worthwhile. So perhaps this conversation can take place with more and more people as time goes by. You know, in five, 10 years, not tomorrow, but it, it'll take some time. But it will translate into how people think in their inner, thought, inner selves as well. I really believe that. I think uh, <coughs> we are almost to an end, uh, my last question to you will be, these days, uh, many monks are found in the laboratories in the name of their brain, I mean, their uh, status of their mind or their calmness, how calm they are can be proven when their brains are taken to the labs. There are many, uh, many uh, universities in the West, more than 17 universities are trying to figure out how meditation can, can change the level of thoughts, feelings and compassionate attitude to, to other, other uh, beings, beings, to, to all, all sentient, sentient beings, beings, creatures. How do, How you, do you feel, feel about, about bongs, bongs being, being the part, part of the lab, lab and, and trying, trying to prove, to prove that, that meditation, meditation can, can change, change the lives of, of many people in this world. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know it's something that Dalai Lama has been very interested in, in um, the intersection between you know, neuroscience and meditation and how meditation can affect even the structure of the brain. I think um, having those kinds of conversations is really important. It's bridging, again, it's going back to, there's two different ways of looking at thing, things with different vocabularies. And as you talk together and find those common areas of understanding that only enriches all of us. So uh, having an open mind and, and, and introducing different what these different viewpoints is, I think it's good. And first, I mean, I can't speak from, I'm not a neuroscientist clearly, but um, I always feel better when I have happy thoughts versus when I'm stressful. And you know, when you have a lot of negative emotions and stress running through your body, your brain's racing. 
you can't you can't sleep you can't stop thinking there's things firing off all the time but when you're when you're happy and you're calm and you're joyful it's your brain is quiet and you can just sit there and watch the world go by in peace i mean that to me that's sort of obvious but i'm not a neuroscience so, so the fact that they're studying all of that i think is really it's really important last question to you is that okay okay so my last question would be the hey, Holy Spirit, Dalai Lama, and a group of scientists are, are trying to come up with a syllabus uh, to, teach, uh, to teach kids, young kids. How important it is to have ethical education or moral-based, value-based education to teach kids so that one day those kids, those kids will, will become, become very compassionate, compassionate astronaut, astronaut or scientist like, like you. Well, I well, think, I think it's, it's important, important to have a strong, strong syllabus, syllabus, but even more important, important uh, you have to have people who are giving, giving examples, examples to the children on how to live. Because you can you create whatever, whatever curriculum, curriculum that, you that you want to, but, but if they're, they're not led by example, by example they won't, they won't absorb, absorb the intellectual knowledge. knowledge. They're going to absorb the experiences that they have and use that so, so if the, the, the curriculum, curriculum has to be supplemented, or I would, or I would say, say the curriculum is a supplement to the, the, the examples, examples that they see. And that's, and that's really, really the, 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 the hard part, part right? right? Because you have to you train have the adults, adults to provide the examples so that the kids can see the examples. examples. And there's a lot of um, not exactly perfect examples out and about in the world around us today. And so having strong examples locally uh, is very, uh, very important, important. And, and, if and if you can design, design a curriculum, curriculum that it helps, helps illustrate, illustrate the power of those examples to the children, children so that the less so it, it helps amplify the lesson, lesson I, think I think that's, that's probably a good thing. thing. But, but having, having a, curriculum a curriculum without, without the, the ready, ready examples, examples is um, is only half the battle, I think. But it's it's a good place to start. Uh, many, many thanks, thanks for all, all the respected, respected people, people for being, being here, here today, today accepting, accepting our, our invitations. invitations. With a big thanks, thanks to Dr. Dr. Sandra and, and Bikash for such insightful, insightful conversation. conversation. Now, now I would, I would like, like to, to conclude, conclude this event for today. today.